Hello, everyone. Sucker you here. And I'm Gabby. And welcome back to the History of Everything podcast. Hello, my hoes. Welcome back in. Welcome back in. Gabby, one of the things that we're doing here today, uh, one of the we saw some not criticism exactly, but pieces of advice for just anyone that is listening in here right now who has been a regular viewer slash listener, general enjoyer of our platform is that you probably noticed that when you're not listening to this on Patreon, that there's a number of ads that take place during this that can be very disruptive. No one likes ads. No one. Nope. Not um, even me. Unless you're weird. I or pay, it's the Super Bowl. I pay for the fan club for every podcast that I like because ads literally throw me off so bad. Yeah. So as a result of that, one of the things that we're going to try to do is that I'm going to be looking at the clock as time goes on. And if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple or any other services where it's a podcast and not just the YouTube channel that it's going to be uploaded to, then what I'm going to try to do is say things every like seven to eight minutes. And just right, saying, I'll, okay, we're going to go to like a quick now here's break. a little ad break. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is we've been... We love our older episodes, but the audio quality was just, it so was bad. awful. Be blunt with we them. just, we didn't have the money to invest in like the proper gear. And he, it took us literally like a year to figure it out and we're still figuring it out. Um, so we're thinking about just removing all of the older episodes from like Spotify and other platforms. We'll put them, we'll like try to reformat them, edit them a little and put them up on Patreon We'll keep releasing new episodes and we'll leave those up, but just like the older. It's the archive. It's like the special Yeah, vault. we'll kind of archive it on Patreon for everyone who is a member there. So you'll still have access to it. Um, but we just, we want to put our best foot forward, I think, as the podcast grows. And the weird thing is. I'm proud of those episodes. Oh, they were yeah. fun. And this is how we learned. But. You know, so many people still tell us to this day, and I've said this multiple times over the course of the podcast, that the first episode is most people's favorite. The one on potatoes. It's my favorite. Yes, it's my Scrofula. personal favorite, too. Scrofula. Yes, it's so much fun. But admittedly, the audio quality of it is terrible. Like not, not even in comparison to what it is now. No, even back then, we knew the audio quality was not the best, but it's all that we could do. At the time. And I know every podcast starts off like that, but still, it, you know. Yeah. So we are thinking about putting all that stuff. So it's still on Patreon. So people still have access to it. But then at the same time, probably that episode, since it's still the most popular, re-recording it. Because I have a feeling that what it happens, and we see this in the numbers when we're looking at our analytics. So many people listen to the first episode. They're probably like, man, that audio quality is bad. And then they don't listen to the rest of it, even when it's drastically increased in quality. So we're probably going to end up doing that. If you haven't listened to it already, while you still have the opportunity before any of that is done, do so because I don't want to remove any of it until we're able to get everything. Yeah, downloaded this and isn't, taken care this of. is going to be like a project over the next few months. Like yes. the producer is going to help us, which we haven't told him that yet. So yeah, <laughs> James, if you're listening, hi, surprise. <laughs> I can't believe you've done this. But anyway, to jump into today's episode, ancient Egyptian medicine. Yes. So I, if you haven't seen this already, uh, we on the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel, we did a short episode that was on ancient Egyptian medicine. I loved that one so much when I was writing it. I was trying to figure out how the hell am I going to condense this thing down to such a short form video. Truthfully, this is a video that should be like this. It should be a podcast and it should go on extensively, but there would be simply way too much to talk about. So I figured that we should take that one. That was the short video, turn that into a full episode so we can go into more detail about some of the stuff and have an actual conversation because I love medical history. I mean, you're a laboratory medical scientist right now, and you've seen some of the weird stuff that has happened in recent history. You can only imagine how it was in the ancient times. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure for doctors, doctors have to hear the most fun stories because my dad's a doctor and you would not believe the things people would say and do. Also, doctors sometimes say and do really weird things as someone who grew up around doctors. Honestly, medical history is so interesting. Like, I love it. Yes, yes, it is. But the older you go back, the weirder it gets, along with interesting and also impressive. It really depends. Because, guys, I'm telling you this now, but if we're talking about the history of medicine, this is something that over the course of history, it's a very long road. It's something that had a lot of ups, 
probably way, 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 way more downs. Um, really, it took a long time for us to get to the point now where we really understand more of biology. And our understanding is still not perfect. Absolutely not. We know it's not perfect. We know it's not perfect, but it is leagues above what it was thousands of years ago. Hell, it's leagues above what we knew 50 years ago. You, I think, duetted that video with Hank Green where they were talking about UTIs and people just dying from UTIs. And, the and you people like, oh, how do you die from a UTI? There's no way that I'm can sure happen. Some, because sometimes a UTI just clears up. Not a lot, but sometimes. And then it progresses, usually. So, well, the usual protocol is UTIs you, eventually do clear up, but it takes a long time. Could you imagine getting taken out by a UTI? That also sounds incredibly like it would be a painful way to go. Like if that it gradually does. would kill you, an infection down there. Ugh. Do you remember that thing I told you about? Where was it happening? I think it was ancient Egypt. It, not even ancient Egypt. It was Which Egypt one? in like the 90s where there was a parasite that was giving men. Oh, yes, 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 yes. No, you explain it. You're the one that told me about it and I didn't even know so myself. So we work, have to talk about minding it. Minding my business as people do when they're at work. And my coworkers like, oh my gosh, did you know that there was this one culture that believed that men also got periods? And I was like, what are you talking about? But continue. So she did proceeded to explain that um, I think it was Egypt. I'm pretty sure it was yes. Egypt. Yes, it was. There I was guess I had to go a verify parasite, this afterwards. Schistom, schistomiasis. I'm mispronouncing that. But Ugh. basically it would get into the male genitalia and cause them to bleed out of it. And it was so prominent. It was so common that men were not like they didn't believe someone was a man until they got their first period from this parasite. Which you would think is really, yeah, we would laugh about it now. But like, if you don't have the knowledge, I mean, and it happens to everyone, it just becomes normal. So if we extrapolate but upon this. I'm just curious, like, was it painful? I, I can't imagine. I'm pretty sure you'd probably get used to it. So if we think about this logically, right, it's ancient Egypt. What is all that surround? What, like, what? what they're, they're, the, it's Nile a farming, River. the Nile River and it's a farming society. Everyone like the Nile River floods, you go down, you plant, the people are working in the Nile all the time. You're collecting different stuff for like the clay to make pottery. You're collecting reeds. You're collecting all the different stuff you need for papyrus. There's everything surrounds the Nile. The Nile but is the source of all of it. The, I, when I looked it up, the article said it was like in the 1990s though. So that's what threw me off. I'm sure it couldn't actually no, be. I think in the 1990s, what it was is that they discovered oh, okay. it. Yeah. Because people didn't know about them before, but they were finding like texts that were describing it because there were a lot of different medical texts and things that were revealing stuff, which we're going to go into in here is the sheer amount of medical texts that were discovered from the 1800s going into the 1900s about ancient Egypt. I just wanted to tell you that fun fact. You should definitely look it up yourself because oh I didn't give all of the details. I didn't have all of the details, but I just thought it was a fun little story that would lead into this, Literal man which period. just shows that medical history is evolving constantly and we don't really you know we don't have all the answers but we do our best oh yeah and take on, it away steven well and on that note since considering it's been around eight minutes we're gonna have an ad break right now and we're back okay so if we are getting into this whole thing the the crazy thing that we need to understand is that yes in ancient history people had some very weird ideas about medicine very weird ideas but they did have a remarkably good understanding in some places in comparison to other places. Like I'll give you this as an example. This is a thing that we're going to touch upon later in here, but it's a really big detail to notice. And that is that in societies like ancient Egypt, the doctors that were from Egypt were prized. So if you had someone who was going to go and receive medical training, like if they were going to study abroad, like when you have someone who goes and is an exchange student in a foreign country to learn, you probably would go to one of those places that is more, famous for that specific kind of development. Yeah, right? something a little more prestigious. Yeah, exactly. So in the ancient world, the medical professionals, if you were going to study abroad, that was Egypt. That's where you'd go. You know, you would go to Greece if you were looking for philosophy. But in the time of like classical Greece, if you were going to have a medical professional, the best doctors that you could get specifically came from Egypt. So that's kind of like the U.S. where the American medical like system is like prized because you can be a doctor from another country. But to come work in the U.S., you have to redo residency. It's a lot of hoops you have to jump through. Yes. But if you train in America, you can just show up like, hey, I'm an American doctor. And they're like, welcome. Come on in. You can do anything you want there. Literally. Like it's just 
Um, and I think I have a lot of, you know, I have a lot of personal things with the American med school system. A lot of it's a lot of hoops with your to brother jump being through. A student himself, yeah. And it's nothing against it. It's just the way that it's set up. It's very obviously set up with I don't know. It's gatekeeping. It's a lot of gatekeeping. A lot of unnecessary hoops to jump through. But that's another story for another day. Let's hear about Egypt. <laughs> Did they make it super gatekeeping? Well, not exactly. Oh, kind of to a degree. You have to remember that literacy was not the highest in ancient times. It really wasn't. So the, in order to do anything with medicine, they had medical texts, right? So if you couldn't read, then you'd have to just memorize. Can and- you imagine the low bar is, can you read? Yes. Then you can be a doctor. You could be because then you'd have to start your training specifically to become it. But there's, there's a whole bunch of that. We're going to get into the entire process because it's really crazy. Ancient peoples, specifically Egypt, had so much more knowledge than what we really give them credit for. Yes, some of this is crazy. Some of it is outright terrible and wrong. But when it comes to other things, they were very remarkably advanced. So today what I wanted to do is I wanted to go into some of that medicine and share with you all some of the pretty cool stuff that we had or that we, I guess, discovered about him or that we found that they knew. A lot of this is very new because this came out in like the um, the 1800s going into the 1900s. You know, when Egyptology was exploding and you had all the people that were going in and trying to uh, uh, find all these texts, Rosetta Stone. All of this, we didn't really know what so much of it was when they were finding all these fragments, these papyri, these all these different things until the Rosetta Stone came out and then they were able to translate them. So it's a huge, vast amount of knowledge that has been discovered literally within the last hundred years about all this. So if we're going to classify ancient medicine, it's traditional medicine. That's what it is. And if you look at the World Health Organization and what it is that they would describe this as, traditional medicine could effectively be described as the sum of knowledge, the skills and the practices that are based off theories, beliefs and experiences that are indigenous to specific cultures, whether that is used for health maintenance uh, prevention of diseases, diagnoses of diseases, whether you're it's like improvement of your health or treatment of physical or mental illness, really any of these things, if it has to do with your health and it's part of the customs, that is traditional medicine. The ancient Egyptians, or really the Egyptian civilization, is one of, if not the oldest long-standing civilization in history. I say longstanding. It's it's not clearly not the same now that it was then, but the scope of how long the Egyptian civilization resting right there along the Nile in the place that now today would be the country Egypt, what it lasted and what it did was insane. We all know. We all know the crazy. It is one of the. I mean, the fact that it survived this long, literal thousands. It's not the exact same, obviously, but it's been around, like centered around the Nile for so long. Really, Egypt stopped being Egypt as we think of it around the the Ptolemaic dynasty, like when it was conquered by the Greeks and then became way more exposed. But prior to that, you're talking about Egyptian dynasties for a good, you know, like 3000 years of just different dynasties. There was how many? How does that compare to like the Roman Empire, all of those other empires? Well, technically speaking, it wasn't the same empire, right? Because you have different dynasties that would rise up. The empire would fracture apart. It would create new ones. The oldest empire in the world is the Roman Empire because it did last from the first century AD all the way until going into the uh, 15th century AD. So around 1500 years or well, 1400 years is how long it lasted. No other empire has been around for that long. But in terms of civilizations, Egypt went on perhaps the longest for what you could attribute to be like the singular civilization. At least I think that that's probably what you'd associate or you'd have to go into Chinese and then all the different dynasties and keep that going. But that's that is a whole different topic or debate for another day. The short of it, though, oh, well, you oh have I was going to give us far. I was like a very soon day because you're going to be doing um, three kingdoms. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because the next one <laughs> I was writing on this was uh, was three kingdoms. We're kind of shifting to more cult like around the world. Yes, history. I, I want to do more. I want to do more. But in Egypt, as we know it. Science, mathematics, geometry, geography, like literally everything that you could imagine for a kind of field. The Egyptians were people that specialized in philosophy. 
Well, I mean, even philosophy to a degree, though, we know that the like the Greeks is being more famous for it. But the Greeks were not doing this in 3000 B.C. No, that was the Egyptians. They were the ones who were thinking about like the, the afterlife and justifying and looking at society, though, to a greater degree, they focused. It looks like more on works. At least we know of it in comparison to what the uh, like what the Greeks and others did. So. It is in ancient Egypt that we can see the first dawn of medical care. Not like what you would have seen in ancient times, right? Uh, or in like prehistoric times where we do have evidence of stuff. Like remember the, um, the case of like the, the, the skulls that have been found with holes drilled into it of people actively having medical care. I can see the look on your face here right now. You it's said a horror. skulls with holes drilled into it. And I immediately was like, please yeah. don't continue down that path. To <laughs> remove brain tumors and other stuff, potentially. There's a whole host of things. I can see you're gagging right now <laughs> looking at this. The thing about the Egyptians, though, is that these were the first to have a whole host of skills. We're talking bone setting, dentistry, simple surgery, the use of medical educational texts which that is huge. That is huge. I don't think people understand that you can have a tradition of medicine, but having texts like textbooks, essentially that would teach you how to do stuff and like what stuff means, not just passed down orally as a tradition. Oh my God, that is huge. Which is bringing me to my next question. Where would I find these texts? You can read them online. They have them translated. You could literally read them online. So one of the ones that we're going to go into and you could cover is like the, uh, Ebers papyrus, E B E R S, if I recall correctly, Ebers papyrus. That that is like the longest one that has been found, and it goes into a whole host of different topics. It explains how certain things work, uh, the way that you treat certain afflictions, all the different stuff. You could go in right now for anyone who's looking at this and just read it. They have translated copies of it. I know what I'm gonna do later. <laughs> And so the medical history is really long. The first uh, the first mention of a physician in history dates all the way back to like the the like the 35th or 36th century B.C., uh, where at the time there you have the the physician second Anakt, which is the chief physician that healed one of their pharaohs from a disease in his nostrils. Right. And when you look at people who were talking about the history of the Egyptians, you had Herodotus, which father of history. Yes, we know. But simultaneously, he embellished a lot of stuff. That's a whole other story for a whole other time. He would write extensively about the Egyptians and their medical practices. Quote, the practice of medicine is so divided among them that each physician is a healer of one disease and no more. All the country is full of physicians, some of the eye, some of the teeth, some of what pertains to the belly and some of hidden diseases. So they were a specialist. Specialist. Now, obviously, he's exaggerating. There's no way in hell a single physician is good for specifically one disease. Well, I think what he meant is that they all had a lot of knowledge about one. So they were, you know, like historians. They'll be like a historian of specifically pirates. Actually, sure. Hold on. Now that you're freezing, I, I think I'm, I'm so they were specialists. It. Yeah. Because so we're even, thinking. I think he, they didn't know everything. They didn't know a lot. It was a lot for one person to know. But if you found the right one for the problem you had, they will have a lot of knowledge about the issue. Even now, I'm realizing that I may have been misinterpreting those words because I'm thinking of it in terms of modern sense. And this is a horrible misunderstanding to have. And I realize where it is that I'm screwing up. We're thinking of things or I'm thinking of things in terms of, oh, yes, one disease like tuberculosis is one disease. But they would think of it as, no, it's the disease of the lungs, uh, the disease of this. So you'll have a specialist who there could be 20 different diseases as we now think of it, but it pertains to one particular aspect of the body yeah, that they specialize in. They didn't in. know the specific, um, you know, they didn't know every single thing that was happening in yeah, the lungs. They didn't have x-rays right. and more uh, advanced diagnostic tests. So to them, it was like, okay, I have had a headache for three months. So they go find a doctor that has dealt with headaches for three months. Now that headache could be a tumor or a migraine, but they wouldn't know that specifically. Yes. No, you're right. You are entirely right there. I, I, or I, a really bad toothache. I don't know. Oh, well, we're going to get into dentist, dentistry because that is among all the different places in here. That is probably where the Egyptians failed the most is when it came to dental stuff. We're going to get into that. But actually on that note of um, specialization, we're going to really need to break that down 
and understand just how doctors and their levels and their hierarchy and how all that worked in Egypt. But before that, we're going to have a little bit of a commercial break. This is my commercial break dance. That's your commercial break dance. (laughs) Maybe that part sticks in in YouTube and nothing else. (laughs) And we're back. Okay, so when we're talking about doctors and the ranks and all the different knowledge between them, we have to understand that in ancient Egypt and in many other societies, too, this is not exclusive to them. There was no clear difference or dichotomy between medicine and magic. That was basically the same thing, right? Anything that was health or illnesses or any of this stuff, this all resulted from the relationship that that person had with the universe. That could include people. It could include animals, good and bad spirits, any of it. It was all about the different balances that existed. And so doctors, their actual belief was somewhat similar to what people would think later on with miasma theory. But it was like miasma theory combined with germ theory and almost like, um, you know, how in like a, like in, in Chinese medicine, you have the idea of the pressure points and the like the chi channels, etc. So in this case, they would believe that spirits would block channels in your body, like the veins, that this would affect the way that the body worked. So what they would look for is ways that you could unblock the channels. That could be a combination of prayers and natural or, you know, non-spiritual remedies, a whole host of different things. Like every single thing that you did was a medicine combined with a prayer or like some kind of ritual that was associated as a spell. So are they doctors, basically priests? Both. They could be. They could be. And that's one of the distinctions that we're going to get into it because it, 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 it's both. Most healers were priests at least in the beginning. But over time, as things would develop, you would start to get a profession that would specifically be a doctor of medicine. They weren't just a priest. And with that, you would have uh, the different ranks of them as Herodotus would describe. So the hierarchy of the medical professionals of what they would do is it would start with something called just the Sunu. And the Sunu was the ordinary doctor. After this, you would have the overseer of doctors, then a chief of doctors, then an eldest of doctors, which in the end actually sounds like that should be the last one. But no, the final one is the one that looks over all of them, which is the inspector of doctors. Okay, so is it just, um, you know, how in a hospital you have like the attendings and the residents and the interns? Yes. And if they can't fix it, it goes to the next higher level then the next higher level for specialists and et cetera. Oh, that's actually really like that. That's actually really great. Yes. Like you'd have the first person that goes in and sees something that they can't figure out. It's going up to the next guy in the rank and then so on and so forth, just as it as it moves up. So can we talk about the ancient Egyptian health insurance for health? Oh, there's an actually interesting thing. Wait, I was joking. No. So this is where it gets odd. And I might be a little bit off on this because (laughs) this is where it gets hazy. We don't really have a lot of the medical records, but, you know, the ancient Egyptians didn't trade necessarily like they could use precious gems and other stuff but you know what the primary means by which you would pay for things was food barley wheat all that other stuff like bread grain that was how you traded for stuff i would simply plant one field that was my health savings account and it was just barley in case i was sick not even kidding that is literally thing that probably could happen with some people not even kidding. Like taxes, everything was based around food. You I would pay love for stuff that. with food. Okay, I'm going to ask if I can just start paying for my doctor's appointments and I'll food. I'll buy you a, ba- a like, set of baby back ribs. Can we call it even? Hello, doctor. My ear doctor, which is my most common doctor that I see. He's my bestie. You go to your British one and you're like, hey there, chap. You want some pork chops? Literally, I'll buy you some French fries. <laughs> <laughs> but that... that it, I don't know the full details on that, but essentially you would pay for things using food. That's the, the, the gist of it. But one of the crazy things is that it wasn't just male doctors, right? It wasn't just a single medical profession that that is something that they would dominate. Physicians in Egypt could be either male or female. The first physician that was later deified as a god of medicine and healing was the architect Imhotep who is best known for designing the Step Pyramid of Djoser at Saqqara. Now, Imhotep is also remembered for initiating secular medicine through different treaties that he would write, arguing that disease 
occurred naturally. It wasn't actually a punishment from the gods. There are other things that are occurring in the world. Yes, it could be spirits. It could be these other things, but it wasn't specifically you being cursed by the gods and being told, yeah, I don't like you. Grow a, grow a tumor. Could you imagine? People believe that. That was the gist of it. I'm not blaming them. I mean, sometimes when I feel off, I'm like, oh, <laughs> you're just like, oh, well, like, it's because I grew up in, me. I grew up with the evil eye culture. So bad eye. Oh, right. Mal de ojo. So where every time I'm a little bit sick, I'm like, oh, didn't Someone wear my thinking bad thoughts about you. I didn't wear my this gemstone ring that I have here is specifically for that. So I'm just saying superstitious. Yes. But it is what it is. <laughs> it's what people believed. And it's gone back for literally thousands of years. And on that note for it here, the, the whole thing with women being um, physicians, that was not a new concept or thing. That goes back very far into the early dynastic periods where you had a person called Medit Ta, who was the royal court's chief physician in 2700 B.C. Merit Ta was the first female doctor that was known in world history, at least that we know. It could go back even further, but this is the records of what we have, and things over time are always being discovered. And there's evidence that suggests that there was a medical school at the Temple of Neith in Sai in Lower Egypt that was run by a woman whose name we don't really know around 3000 BC. So that goes back even older. We just don't have any specifics that would tell us. It makes sense for women to be more active in the medical field because when you're sick, when you were a kid, it was your mom who took care of you and she probably took care of your entire family. So it just makes a lot of sense that women would learn over time how to care for someone because caregiver. Yeah. Yeah. So that there's, checks out. No, there's all kinds of things. It's really, it's really interesting to look at, right? Because Again, you're talking about places where naturally the mother was the nurturer. That was something that would take care of people when you would have uh, like gods of medicine or not necessarily that. But when you have you have gods of medicine that were male, but then you would have like goddesses of health specifically of like, you know, you, they would be the ones that would protect you, the nurturers, the protectors, these kinds of people. So other examples like uh, Pesahet, which is another female physician. She is often cited as the uh, first lady overseer of female physicians, which was possibly associated with the school at Psy, which does really speak that there was a presence of women in medical practices at that time. There's legends of uh, Agondis or uh, Agnodi Agnodi Agnodice. Agnodice is probably what it is. Agnodice of Athens, which relates to this idea of women not being able to enter the medical field in Greece because Greece was a very male dominated society because she was a woman. So remember what I said about like where you go to study abroad, if you really wanted to get into medicine, Egypt, you go to Egypt. So the legend is she goes down to Egypt where women are respected in the field. And that's where you could actually become a doctor. Now, how and where doctors receive their training or to what degree we don't know. I'm sure there are some texts somewhere that either exist or have been destroyed over time, but we don't know. We just have theories about where some of these schools were and some evidence like that there was probably an important school that was in Alexandria, as well as that one that we talked about earlier in uh, in Psy. So now the question becomes, what makes a doctor? So a doctor not only needed to be literate. Because it was very important for you to understand your medical text that you were reading and studying to know what was what. But you also had to be pure. This isn't talking about anything for someone being like a virgin or any of that, which some places would have in the case of, say, priests or other things. This is more so referring to that someone had to be clean in body and also spirit. So doctors had to be ritually pure. They were expected to bathe frequently. And as carefully as a high priest would be. That is actually so good because it would probably lead to cleanliness. Exactly. Which means they would pass on less. Germs. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, I hope for the love of God that you weren't necessarily just using the same Nile water that other animals were defecating in because then you're going to run into a situation like in the case of the Ganges. Um, I'm assuming also you pronounced that wrong, but I'm assuming they used the water they had. 
They used to it go is, to the It is possible. And at least to a degree, with that time in the ancient world, it would have been better than what it otherwise would have been. But it's still really good to know because in the medical world, or not in the medical world, the, um, the, um, the, the priestly world, that's what I'm thinking of. In order to go into the temples, in order to serve the gods, you had to be clean. You didn't bring dirt and filth into their presence. So you always were bathing. You were always holding yourself to a higher degree of cleanliness. You know, in like the 1800s, I'm, I'm not exactly sure when Semmelweis was a doctor, but. Oh, was that the hand washing guy? Hand washing oh, guy. <laughs> when women were dying of literally sepsis because doctors were doing. They were literally, you know, dealing with ca- cadavers and then delivering babies. And then a few days later, the mom would go into sepsis. And this guy, Semmelweis, was like, hey, wash your hands. I think you're killing these ladies. And everyone was like, how dare you accuse doctors, doctors of killing people? Like, we would never. We are doctors. And so he got mocked and actually died in a madhouse. And eventually we all learned he was right. Yeah. And that's yeah. um literally, it's so sad, but at least the ancient Egyptians were like, Haha, be clean, doctors. <laughs> it's very important. So they ancient Egyptians won. Yeah, ancient Egyptians won. Absolutely. Yeah, they're Absolutely. they're winning. They they beat them. So as we talked about before, though, uh, doctors had their own kind of specialty, right? They had their own things that they were skilled in. But before we go into that, we're gonna have a commercial break. James, please leave my commercial break dances in. And me staring awkwardly at the camera, I guess, while doing this. And we're back. Okay. So as I said, each doctor had their own specialty and the general practitioner, that person that was just the doctor, that was the SNU, right? And then this was the person that focused more on the medical aspect with medicine. And then you had another type that was called a, like a Sao. And that Sao was one whose specialty was using magic. Oh, I was like, wait, doctor of medicine? What else would that be? The medical doctor? Okay, that, that checks out. Sorry. Yeah. I was you, about to make so much fun of you. Because one of the crazy things that you would have here is, is that there are obviously diseases that people just wouldn't be able to fix, right? Like you would have things such as cancer and other stuff that- Did were, cancer exist back then? Yes, I mean, I'm has, assuming it did, it did. because- they it's would be able to identify tumors and other cells. stuff. And if they couldn't remove something via, via surgery or something else, which yes, they did surgery. They were able to do all of that. If they couldn't identify or remove something, there were cases where the final level of medicine in there was to just say like the prayers for the afterlife, that there was nothing that they could do. Hospice care. Pretty much. My question is how common do you think cancer was? That's a good question. I don't know. We wouldn't be able to necessarily tell the rates of just that people be knew. Proper documentation of death certificates or causes of death. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Exactly. Okay, continue. That is also one of the reasons, though, why we do know about a little bit more the frequency of some of the wealthier diseases that people experienced of the higher classes. Because like, they had people, scrolls, yeah, scribes who like would. The presence of gout and other stuff. Yeah, they'd record all of that. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. So when you had midwives, masseurs, masseurs nurses, attendants, and seers, all of these different people, all these different specializations and what they did, these groups would assist the doctors. Doctors were thought to really not necessarily have anything to directly do with births because these would be handled more by midwives and women of the house. That was something that was more to their profession, kind of like what you talked about in the beginning. Okay, actually, I was writing a podcast episode months ago on... um you know, infant care and infant mortality oh. rates throughout history. I, I never finished it. it was, <laughs> I, I got sidetracked. But basically when doctors were trying to save babies and like save premature babies, there was pushback from the entire culture because they were like, no, that is the job of a mother. So then doctors couldn't actually help these moms because it was the woman's job to take care of the children and to, you know, raise them and care for them but these were premature babies. You know, rather than so then there was a like life. this whole fight, this whole struggle where it was like, okay, well the doctors can save your baby and you can't. And it was just, it kept switching back and forth for a little bit there. I should finish that episode. I might. I, I might. actually want to hear about it. I would love for it's you to educate me on that topic. Written. I just keep getting distracted by life. <laughs> you know, it, my real job. As it does oftentimes happen. But now speaking of stuff that is incomplete or weird or other stuff, um, remember how I talked about, we were going to talk about dentistry. 
Yes. Yeah, all right. Now, this is for anyone who gets maybe a little bit uh, uh, weird about this stuff. Just 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 know beliefs are odd. And I can only imagine how horrifying this would be if it was real. Just disclaimer, if it gets gory and you're not OK with gory, is it gory? No, we're not going to say gory, just like disturbing. We, yeah, disturbing and graphic here. So dentistry, right? It grew out of the established medical profession but it never really developed as widely. The, the Egyptians did so much stuff when it came to surgery, when it came to uh, medical, other medical practices involving pol- polytusis. Is that the term? Polytusis? Pol- pol- like, you know, the stuff when you're making like a mesh of something that goes onto a wound and that kind of thing. It's not even written on here. No, I don't know what that is. No, I'm, I'm just asking you outright. I can't remember the product or the, like the pronunciation of that word. Either way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't know. I'm sorry. It's fine. I can't even remember it. It's bothering me now. The short of it is that they knew so much, but they didn't really know much about med- about dental care. The ancient Egyptians would suffer from dental problems throughout their entire history. And dentists were not really plentiful, not like other doctors, or at least it wasn't really well documented. We don't really know. Doctors also practiced dentistry, but there were dentists that would go back all the way to the early dynasties. I have a question. So we did look at this previously, I think, in a YouTube video or a TikTok where people in the past actually had better teeth than we do nowadays because our diets were better. So did the ancient Egyptians have something in their diets that caused their teeth? Hunter-gatherer, and we're going to get into that. So more fruit, more sugar? Not necessarily, no. Hunter-gatherers had a more varied diet. And that's where we're going into. That's a huge difference. Remember what the Egyptians were. And we'll cover this. We'll cover this in it. but. The Egyptians were farmers that lived, the majority of people lived off just a couple key things. Wheat, barley, and like a couple vegetables. Very rarely did they have other stuff here. So since 90% of your, I'm not, it's probably a larger percentage that I'm using, but since the overwhelming majority of your calories specifically came from bread, you had such a deficiency in other things that your health was lower. It's one of the reasons why, remember we covered beer? Yeah. And how early beer was so much more chock full of vitamins and that actually was health. Like beer was healthy because beer beer was like the equivalent of a nutrition shake that many people would have. A protein shake. Literally it was. A carb shake. Yeah, it was a carb shake. Pretty much. You could say a carb shake and it had so many other uh, nutrients and other stuff that would go into it. But that was a really big detail. So basically their diet led to more dental problems then. Yes. Okay. Because they didn't have the nutrition for a number of things. So the the first dentist that we know of in the world is an Egyptian by the name of Hesser, who was chief of dentists and was the physician to the king under the reign of Joser. And dental problems were exceptionally prevalent in Egyptian society because of their diet, which was primarily coarse bread and also inability to keep things like sand out of the food. So it was wearing away at their teeth. It was literally it's like someone wearing who away grinds at their, teeth. their own teeth down. Oh, low quality food plus coarse things that are physically shaving it. Ooh. Like when you grind your teeth, you know, and but sand because sand is something that people have used literally to do construction in order to uh, like to wear away stone. So if you can do that to stone, it's going to get your teeth. Yes. So Egyptians of all eras from the early to the late period, they had all terrible teeth. Well, not all, but it was way more common and all kinds of different issues associated with it. But by the New Kingdom period, over time, it just got worse. So physicians, sometimes what they would do is they would do things like packing teeth with honey and and like herbs in order to try and stem infection or ease pain. Which you can imagine if your tooth is already rotting and you are adding honey, which is sugar, to the gums. It, you're just feeding the bacteria that are already there. But honey was already used in so many different places or different things as a thing to help infections. But so honey, they, that's what honey they know. is good for like it cures burns. I mean, it depends on the honey, I guess. Yeah, but they wouldn't the understand black and other stuff and what that would do. Yeah. It would literally aid tooth rot. Now, it's not known if the different um, dental things, like in the case of mummies being provided with bridges of gold teeth and other stuff, were used by when people were alive or dead. So we don't really know if people had like gold teeth and other stuff while they were still alive. But it is possible that with their 
teeth already rotting by the time that they died that they would just replace all of their teeth with gold. Yeah, I know. I just smacked the thing. If anyone just heard that right there, but it's possible that they replaced their teeth with gold going into the afterlife so that that way, you know, the Pharaoh would be able to eat because they believed when they would bury people that whatever they buried them with, that's what they would have in the afterlife. So when you'd have all those um, canoptic jars, is that the term? I believe that's the term, but the canoptic jars, they were full of sweets and cakes and bread and all the different things that they would eat, that that is something that they would use. So it makes sense that they would do that specifically for when they would die. In fact, there were some famous ones. We all know uh, Queen Hapchepsut, right? Or am I mispronouncing the name? Hapchepsut? Hapchepsut? You're mispronouncing the name, but continue. So the queen, this, this very famous Egyptian pharaoh queen, like one that is arguably one of, if not the most famous uh, pharaoh, with the exception of like Cleopatra, arguably you could say she was the ruler in the new in uh, she was a ruler during the new kingdom period. And she had died from an abscessed tooth as many people did. Like that was one of the more common deaths that would occur for pharaohs and for rulers and people of the upper classes. Toothaches, dental problems. All of these were thought to be caused by a quote tooth worm which would need to be driven out of the body by magical, uh, by magical spells, incantations, and the collection of herbs and other stuff they would use, like honey. You know, it's just kind of odd, too, because you used honey on this. I think it's a creature. It was a creature that was on your teeth, and it was eating the honey to get bigger and stronger. Not a good thing. But that is something that, that, that belief goes all the way back to, uh, about, back to Mesopotamia, specifically in uh, Sumer where incantations against toothworm have actually been found in the cuneiform, like the wax tablet scripts. But all the while they had like tooth decay. All the while they had tooth decay. So they just need root canals. They would need root canals essentially. But can you imagine getting something like that with no anesthetic that they would have? Hell, I'm just glad the- I didn't figure out root canals. <laughs> this is also before distilled alcohol. Okay. But we're talking about things that you wouldn't want have to have done without, you know, pain relievers. Yeah. But chainsaws yeah. were invented. For childbirth, yeah. But they expected the woman to die at that point. You yeah, know, yeah, but they pain. Ex- yeah, but they expected her anesthetics. to die at that point. So it's like, you know, it wasn't a preventative feature. That was, uh, that was, that was the end. They knew what was happening right there. It's a feature, not a bug. Okay, on that note, let's take a break. Yeah, commercial break time while you think about that horrible thing. As with doctors, dentists would use all kinds of magical incantations in order to try and drive the toothworm from the patient, and then they would apply what medicines they thought that they could use in order to ease the pain. They would use different kinds of herbs. They would use spices medicinally. Uh, As an example of this, if you had chronic bad breath, you could use a mixture of honey, cinnamon, myrrh, frankincense, frankincense, and pignin. Pinion? To make like a chewing gum Yeah, basically like a kind of chewing gum ball thing that you'd be able to um, uh, to, to chew on to relieve yourself of bad breath. So they make gum, like they could just walk up to someone, offer them gum in ancient Egypt and it's like, oh, your breath. Pretty much. Your breath. Yeah, the ancient equivalent of it. So (laughs) there's evidence of tooth extraction because you got to remove it at some point where it's really bad. Uh, False teeth, opium being used as an anesthetic. So they did have, you know, some degree of anesthesia. So then they could have figured out root canals. Come on. They were so close. To a degree. (laughs) But really, the importance of diet was something that was really recognized. And the changes in one's diet in order to improve their health, that was suggested. Practical, hands-on remedies were always applied first in the cases of obvious injuries, like where something was very, very clearly wrong. But with toothaches or gum disease, just with any kind of other regular disease inside your body, the first thing that they would assume is, okay, there is something supernatural going on here. Like if you're missing an arm, they're not going to look at you and go, hmm, the gods have done something to you. <laughs> no, we're going to need to figure out that first. But if you Don't, have a we'll headache. S- yeah, if you have a headache, yes. But we need, we'll, we'll figure, we'll stop the bleeding afterwards. We need to figure out what God has cursed you here first <laughs> or something. Which, no, that wasn't what they would do. They could very clearly see when something physically was wrong. From that note, 
the Egyptians really did have a surprising knowledge about anatomy. I, I say surprising, but the, it is kind of understandable as to why they would know a number of things. They had quite a bit of knowledge of diseases of the like osseous, elementary, respiratory, circulatory, genital diseases, muscular diseases, any number of different things that you can think of. Nervous, ocular, auditory, olfactory. All of that. They would know... They, they were able to distinguish different diseases or types of issues of all these different areas, and they would be able to describe them in detail. They identified the function of the heart, like they knew what the heart was and what it did, uh, how it related to the two types of blood vessels. In addition, they did also know what cerebrospinal fluid was. Now, of course, that all being said, that's crazy. Their understanding was not perfect as we really figure out a lot of that stuff when it came to dentistry, they did wrongly think that the heart was the center of the body for all fluids, not just blood, but urine, tears, semen, literally everything. The heart was the center of all of it. I can understand why they would think that though. It's like thinking it's what pumps earth was the center of the, you know what I mean? Like I get why they would come to that conclusion. Yeah. So surgeons, would use all kinds of various implements that are similar to what we would use today, like scalpels, forceps, scissors, splints, different things that were made of reeds. They use splints. Yeah, like if you had um, like if you had a broken limb and you could get reeds, you would tie it together using strips of linen and other stuff that was then padded by pieces of like like wood with uh with plant fibers. You know, so like as a supportive thing in order to support people and their limbs. They could suture wounds. They could stop bleeding using cautery. Uh, boils, abscesses, septic wounds, all of these could be opened surgically and then drained using pieces of linen. And this is the word that I was looking for, the, the pol- poltuses, 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 is that how it is pronounced? It's a poltus, yeah. Poltus. Wow. But, but, listen, for the longest time, I've read fantasy books and every time I would see that word, I would think, ah, oh, poltus. Okay, one thing I've noticed about you, and don't take this the wrong way, this is probably not the time, but I have to say it. Okay, go for it. You it. you know how you learn how to sound stuff out as a child? I feel like at some point you never learned that. I did? You skipped it. I did. Because you'll say a word and you will swap all of the, like every single syllable, you'll swap it. Think, and it's so frustrating to me. I think at one point what happened is I read a word one way. I think way, you read it too quickly. I, I read it too quickly and it just stuck that way with me for the rest of it because that's how what I thought. Because to this day, I'm like, please, you just skipped over like five of those syllables. Like, and some of them are like, <laughs> move to the beginning. You're just shuffling What am them. I doing? Speaking French? You shouldn't be skipping that many syllables. <laughs> <laughs> it stresses me out greatly. <laughs> so they could do all kinds of things, right? If you had a dislocated shoulder, they could treat that in a similar way to the modern uh, culture method, which is the culture culture method. I'm not even sure how I should describe this. I'm not a medical professional. OK, if you didn't pick up on that already, I'm not this. But that that's a thing where they, they'd have the arm up here. They would move it to the side and then like they would rotate the body out and then pop it back into place. You know, it's not a pleasant thing, no matter what. A dislocated limb is not pleasant, but it's way more effective than what some people would do of like, oh, yeah, let me just grab your arm and just shove it. Did that scare you? It did. You, do. you don't have a dislocated limb. If you're on YouTube, you're going to just see me go. <laughs> so wow. th- the short of it, though, is that they could treat all these different things. And and if you broke a limb, like if you had a fractured limb, like a wrist or something, they could make a kind of rudimentary cast that would use linen that was soaked in sticky material, which when it hardened would form a cast. Clearly not as not as developed or as tough as what we'd have nowadays, but that was still something that would help restrict it. And as this was Egypt, ancient Egypt, our knowledge of their knowledge of their beliefs, it's not complete, but it is aided through the fact that we have a ton of different medical records and medical journals about it. Stuff that we've been able to find over the past hundred years, as I was talking about, to really understand them. Archaeologists have found all kinds of different written records that would describe their medical practices, their beliefs, their teaching systems, everything, such as one which was the Ebers Papyrus, like what I was talking about. Yeah, from earlier. Yes. This thing is huge. It has over 700 different remedies and magical formulas, along with a whole bunch of different incantations, all of which are aimed at repelling demons and different things that would cause diseases. 
the author probably, or authors, I guess in this case, probably wrote it around 1500 BC or so, but we don't know. That document may contain copies of previous medical texts that go back all the way to 3400 BC, like knowledge that has been passed on for the last 2000 years. How do you think they compile that if it's over so many years? Like, did they just keep that book and keep passing it down? Like at some point when it gotten destroyed, did they have copies of it? So you know how they would have scribes, like people would be training and learning how to read and write, right? Yes. So the way that you would practice reading and writing, like when you're learning is you copy. So one of the best things that you could do for a person training to be a scribe is you are training by copying older texts. So if that is the material, think of it like this. Imagine what were the if, chances of them copying the text incorrectly? It could happen. It could happen, but it would be reviewed by the person that is training them. That makes, can you imagine having to read the same thing multiple times? Stressful, but I get it. Welcome yeah. to teachers nowadays and what it is that they have to do. Imagine I the same material teachers. every single year that they, or month that they would have to learn. I couldn't do it. Yeah. I could not do it. <laughs> I mean, I already repeat myself enough as it is on the different things that I do for videos and other stuff, but that kind of, at least that's how I imagine it for what it is that they would do to get these copies again and again and again and but again. There Are they like the oldest? Maybe there are, there are older ones possibly, but we don't know. You have to remember so much stuff has been lost and destroyed. So much of it has. The scrolls that we do have though, they provide some evidence of the different kind of scientific procedures that they would do. Doctors would have a bit of a good knowledge about bone structure. They had a kind of awareness of how the brain and the liver would work. They even had a degree of understanding of mental illness. I say degree, not the best, but remarkably more so than what some other peoples of that time thought. And even people of later times would think like, the document in the Ebers Papyrus really describes in detail the characteristics, the causes, and the treatment for different medical disorders of the mind, like dementia and depression, when people would be experiencing it. That's so sad that they would be depressed back then, because nothing was... Hold on, hold on, hold on. You're talking about people whose teeth are rotting out and are like dead, like so many people are dying from literally their teeth. Yeah, but they didn't have Instagram to compare themselves to, so... Wins. I don't know how to process all that around. statement. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> the short is they knew about these different things and they, they saw these mental illnesses as a kind of combination between two different aspects. You had the whole blocked channels, like it was a physical illness that was inside your body. And it was also because of the influences of evil spirits and curses so basically from the, gods. the Caribbean parent. Yeah. Yeah. My Caribbean parents. Yeah. So it's like that, except they would also associate it as a physical illness that you, it, it was there, not just, oh, you're worried. Like th there was a physical was thing. More that they so referring to, to angry gods, but yeah. Oh, no, the angry gods. Definitely. That is a huge thing with it, especially with the influence of spirits. They had different knowledge in there that came from family planning because the scroll would contain different sections on birth control, how to tell if a person was pregnant and other gynecological issues. What were their birth controls? They had Please a variety. Enlighten them. We made, we made a couple shorts on this. Made a couple shorts on this because I told you when I did this video, we had to talk about this. So th th here's two things. When they were trying to test and see whether or not a woman was pregnant, the, the standard protocol for it was for a mother to pee on sown seeds of barley and uh, wheat. Or in bags of barley and wheat, right? Yeah, like, well, like if you plant it, like you're not just on the physical bag itself, but like you take the bag, you plant it, and then you just pee in the field where that is, right? Like, or like in that spot where you're doing it. And then what would happen is they would wait for the seeds to sprout, right? Like if it sprouted, if it germinated, if you could physically see it, then that meant that you were pregnant. But wouldn't that make sense for them to not take it out of the bag? So if it's in the bag and they urinate on the bag and it germinates in the bag... Well, they would take bags. because there's no point to plant it. If you plant it, it's going to germinate from anything but the urine. But if you have it in the bag, so they Maybe would just pee on the that. bag. They, you are, yeah. Oh, oh, wait, wait. I know. Oh my god, I'm messing this up because I know exactly what it is. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like with um. And that's why I'm here, folks. Does anyone remember what would happen with the lima bean experiment? Did you ever do that as a kid? Yeah, you'd put it on paper and then you put some water in there and you'd cover it and you'd see if it sprouts. So like I'm assuming they just had a bag of the seed and then you'd urinate on it. And then if it sprouted, then you're pregnant. If it didn't sprout, then you're not like that's. 
Pretty or at least much. if it, if it, yeah, rather than producing a plant, if it produces a little tendril of like, are they going to put a bag of seed on the ground and then pee in a line? Come on. Think about the, this logically. Just, just waddling up and down just, the line as you just go release. Of like barley. Like, like you know those um you know those tractors where they're like gradually like spraying chemical <laughs> and pesticides are going, but it's a woman waddling along as she goes. Pee you think of her. things way too literally, way too practically. Welcome <laughs> to my literally mind. Literally, like a bag of wheat, and they're just gonna go. And then if it sprouts without like any earth, like dirt, water, or, you know, yeah. then they'll know. Yeah. And then also, didn't they have like a gender test that way where. Yeah. The idea was if it was wheat, then it was a boy. If it was barley, then it was female. Um, How accurate was that? I have no idea. That was just the idea. That was a theory. Okay. But birth control. Birth control. Okay. So one of the things that they had here um, is an example is, is, is crocodile dung. Uh, they would take a mixture, like a clump of crocodile dung, mix it with honey and probably a couple other things, and they would jam it up the hoo-ha, and that was the um, the plug that would stop a woman from getting pregnant. That would probably work, like, because it would be really thick. It's like a female condom almost. But my question is, were there that many crocodiles that they were yes. just collecting the dung? Was there like a specific dung collector or did each person just go out and collect their own dung or could you just show up to the market and be like may i have one cup of dung please all of it all of it you could use it for anything and you have to think that crocodile dung was something that was used in different things from medication it was used for uh there are cases of being used for like cosmetics there was all kinds of different dispersing stuff. evil spirits i think i read that somewhere yes all kinds of different in your stuff. notes <laughs> so you exactly so you'd have people that would be selling it but you'd also have people that would go out and harvest it well, one of the crazy things, this is a little side note uh, for just ancient Egyptian society in general. A wild thing is, is that you would have like, let's say with uh, like potters and other stuff, there was a significant case of men going out to harvest the materials, like doing the labor to go out and get all the things that were needed to make stuff. And then the woman was actually at home making the things that would be sold in like a tr- in like a trade shop. So if you had a potter. Yes, the whole family would be working together, but the man was oftentimes going out, gathering the clay, getting everything that they would need. And then the woman was there making the pottery. That sounds so relaxing. We have it flipped. I go out and work and you make YouTube videos. Lovely. I don't even know how to challenge that in here because I'm <laughs> like, yeah. And the goal of it, if you continue to support us and get on Patreon is to free her from her hell. No, I just want to go to grad school. I'm going to go to grad school. I cannot depend on the internet for money. That is so scary. It's true. It is actually a terrifying thing at different points. But uh, there was a whole host of different things that they did. Again, they they had knowledge about skin problems, uh, dental problems, diseases related to the eyes, intestinal diseases, parasites. They could surgically treat things like with abscesses or tumors there. And like, as we talked about with the fractures, they we had knowledge that they knew about how to set bones and heal burns and different stuff. And how did they lose that knowledge? Because, you know, other cultures at that time did not have it. And then as society progressed, you could see in like the Victorian era, they didn't have a lot of knowledge. So how did they lose that over time? Well, we have the internet, right? We have the internet now that spreads knowledge everywhere. But they weren't sending their book of medicine to another country. And also so many people could not read hieroglyphs. That was not a thing that people could right read. language barriers. That's so sad. So until if they the Rosetta were, Stone, no, we had these texts. Like some of these texts we have had since the 15, 16, 1700s when they were found, did not get translated for several hundred years after because they didn't have the ability to translate them. Oh, that's so sad because I feel like this would have been really useful yeah. for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, and of course, then the people have to be trained. They have to verify it. It's all tied to the culture. A lot of it is tied to indigenous medicine as well. Because what they would believe about one thing, you'd have another society that would go, they don't know what they're talking about. We clearly know in ours because this is our belief going back several hundred or thousand years. And on that note, some of the stuff that they would advise for, like what they would try to do, the advice that they would give in different points was actually pretty nice. But in order to know that, you got to wait until we get after here for the commercial break. Breakdance? It's a break dance. I'm so funny. It's a break <laughs> dance. And we're back. Okay. So they you were in the middle of your 
break dance. My commercial break, break dance, guys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they would advise people to do all kinds of things like wash and shave their bodies. It wasn't just a thing for the priest. They would advise regular people. Hey, wash, shave the, the like hair on your body is a breeding ground for uh, like for parasites and for all these uh, ideas for evil spirits to latch onto. You wouldn't want that. Eat carefully, avoid unclean animals and raw fish. Raw fish is so good. When prepared properly, don't just eat things that are raw. Some things, of course, were less familiar, like the whole idea of putting crocodile dung up the hoo-ha and using it to dispel evil spirits. I don't know if I can. Oh, there have been things. right. On YouTube. I don't know if I can. That's why saying it once or twice is not going to be a problem, but I don't know how the algorithm is going to react to things. You're so I'm right. going to be careful. Yeah. But in short, the, the takeaway from all of this really is that ancient Egyptians were really sophisticated. They have all different kinds of methods for practicing medicine. They would combine things from the supernatural with the natural. They would take herbal remedies. They would have surgeries. And really, it's their written records that have allowed this kind of knowledge to pass down through the ages. A lot of it is not accurate. A lot of it. Some of their theories and their practices, though, were not very different from what it is that we've used today. And again, this so video. They, they, they had like the right idea. They just didn't have the full knowledge to implement it. Yeah. There, like the scientific process wasn't a, a thing there at that time, though, though, this is a detail that they actually had for uh, for medical knowledge that something could be not proven or disproven necessarily, but it could be changed. So the idea was, um, let's say you had a doctor and that doctor was someone who like a person comes in with an illness. They go and consult their text like, OK, I need to figure out what this is. And the medical text says that they're supposed to treat them with X, Y, Z. So they go and do that. They treat it for four days using that method that has been described and it doesn't work. If after four days it has not worked, then the doctor is allowed to make their own judgment to change the treatment to something else. Because it could be something different than what they thought or they misinterpreted what the signs were for what it was because maybe the text wasn't wrong. So with that, that, what would happen is that a doctor could get in a lot of trouble if they were just doing their own thing and not consulting the text. Like if you just had someone who came in and like the text say that you're supposed to treat it one way and they just go off and do something else and that patient dies, they could lose everything. They could be executed. They could lose all their stuff. But if they did follow the procedure and it didn't work, they were allowed to change. They weren't, they didn't have to just go, oh, well, sorry about your luck. For whatever reason, you're cursed. This thing isn't working. So that, that, that's actually nice because it means that there was a degree of, um, not, not what's the word that I'm probably Trial using? and error. Trial and error. That was the thing, which usually in the terms of medical history sounds very bad. But when you're just starting and you have no prior knowledge of this, trial and error is all you have. To this day, mm-hmm. trial and error is what we have. Yeah, Exactly. The fact that they were able to change things to something else that they thought it could be in order to heal and change the process and didn't just stick with the same thing. Like in the case of the big thing in history, leeching over and over and over and over again. Oh, no, uh, your headache is still there. (laughs) Guess we should try leaking more blood. I think a lot of that era of medicine was a lot of pride. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, I think it was just a lot of pride. Surety and all. It's just like what you talked about with the hand washing. Like Like, they literally were. Okay, we're because it was in an era where people had, you know, there were so many societal rankings and everything. Of course, there was a lot of pride. So they would not adjust to this day in modern era. There is a lot of pride in medicine and dentistry and science. There's a lot of pride. So. It's the inability to accept new information. So, you know, where you literally during this podcast went, oh, yeah, I'm messing that up completely because I'm just thinking about it in a really wrong way. A lot of people don't have the ability to go, hey, I was looking at this incorrectly. I'm I need glad to I can re- admit to being stupid sometimes. I mean, you are. You're <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> One thing you're good at is admitting you're stupid. <laughs> But no, just the ability to look at something when they get new information and say, hey, I was wrong. This is how I should look at it. That's that's huge in science and medicine and history. That's huge. And I think a lot of people have too much pride to just 
say, hey, I was wrong. Exactly. That is my TED talk. No, it's good. Also, we don't have a family history this week because I don't think anybody sent in a family history in like two weeks. There are probably some stuff that we could pull from necessarily, but I have, we'd have to go back and find. Considering that we're going to be recording a series of these back to back to back to back, we'll get more of them ahead of time to be able to be prepared for them. But make sure to go to historyofeverythingpodcast.com and submit your family history. It could be a funny anecdote about your grandma. I think everybody's story deserves to be told. Exactly. Thank you to everyone who has been listening. I hope you have the good rest of your day. I hope you enjoyed this. If there's any suggestions that you have, email us. Email them to us. If you go to our website, there is a contact tab. The family history contact, just send us your suggestions for new episodes because we want to research and talk about more of what you want to hear. So just let us know. If you want ad-free episodes, join us on Patreon for a dollar a month. You get bonus episodes as well as ad-free episodes. Um, on top of that, buy our coffee if you can to help support. It's a great thing. Make sure I should have put this at the beginning and I'll probably have a little blurb that goes here that from what we, um, what we had when I need to send over to the editor, but make sure to get this month's audiobook. Uh, it is a book on Iran. So that's going to be a very, very fun and spicy one because not nearly as many people know about Iranian history. And I cannot wait to dive into that, but there is any number of things that you can do to support this channel. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that you all have a good rest of your day and please join us next time on the history of everything podcast. My hose. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.